How should Christians think about marijuana? Is it really dangerous? Is it addictive? Is it an area Christians can just agree to disagree on? Or are there some deeper moral principles that need to be taken into consideration when we think about this issue? Well, we're here today uh, with a friend of mine, Todd Miles. He is a professor, and uh, he has written a fascinating new book that doesn't come out until July or August this summer. But he agreed to come on early and start talking about a topic that when he sent me the manuscript and it's on cannabis and the Christian, I thought I'm getting asked this question all the time by students. I want to know what he thinks. So we're going to jump in to start. But uh, Todd Miles, thanks for coming on. It's really good to be with you, Sean. So let me start with just a, a basic question. Why write a book on marijuana and the Christian faith? Well, because I don't think as Christians, we've done much thinking about marijuana. Uh, quick little story. Uh, when recreational marijuana was made legal in Washington, which is just right across the river from Portland, the day after it was legalized at our church, we had a congregant come in and ask the pastoral staff and elders, is it okay if I go across the river and buy some marijuana now that it's legal? And we, we realized that the typical answer that the church has just relied upon for so long, well, no, you can't because it's against the law, that really no longer obtained. And so we had to do something that may, it might sound strange, but really important. We had to start thinking like Christians for a change. Wow. Uh, how, how should a Christian think about marijuana? Uh, how do we bring the, the wisdom of the scriptures to bear upon this issue? Um, I, I did a talk just like two months later. I, I put put together some, two, some some quick thoughts. I did a talk at a pastor's conference, got up to do my little intro on it and said, hey, I'm going to talk about the pastor in pot. And uh, and, and everybody laughed. It, it, everybody laughed. And for, for, for the rest of the day before the breakout session, it, it was like, hey, how about marijuana and the minister, the deacon and the doobie, your trinity and tree. Oh and it, I mean, it's just, just a ton of stuff. And, and I thought, man, this is just a joke. No one's going to show up. Uh, but but when the breakout session started, it was basically a plenary uh, oh where, where like everyone was there. Everyone was there. And and, and since then, I, I've been Idaho, Montana, Washington, Oregon, California talking about this because there's we just haven't done a lot of thought on on it. We haven't done a lot of thinking on it. Well, I agree. I, my, the first book I wrote in 2006 was called Ethics with an X. And I had a chapter on this and there was not a lot of resources by Christians who had oh, thought clearly the issues come a long ways since then. Uh, for those of you joining us here with Todd Miles, he has a book coming out this summer with uh, Broadman and Holman on cannabis and the Christian. And so we're talking about how should Christians think and approach marijuana. Now, obviously, the Bible doesn't directly address marijuana like it does, say, alcohol. So how can we speak of a Christian position when the Bible doesn't seem to directly address it? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a really important question. Now, clearly, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us everything about everything, right? We, we, we have to use wisdom and we have to use the revelation that God has given to us. And, and I believe that the Bible is sufficient, that God has given us all the divine words that we need to live faithfully before him. The scriptures tell us that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's not probably limited just to the Bible, but certainly the church, the Holy Spirit. Lots of, so there's there's lots of resources that we have to live faithfully before the Lord. And, and so, so now then it's just a matter of taking those divine words, uh, bringing to bear biblical wisdom in a manner that's consistent with God's revelation. Uh, unless we think that this is one of those things that God just doesn't care about. Sure. And... I don't think there's anything that God doesn't care about. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he is the Lord and the creator. Uh, he owns us. He wants us to take every thought captive in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, I, I think he does care about this. And, uh, and he, he's given us what we need to, to, think, to think about it. So first off, I want to know how common marijuana use is with teens and adults. And I noticed, I don't know the stats on this, but maybe five or 10 years ago, it felt like, because I've taught high school full-time and part-time 18 years, and I have three mm -hmm. teens in my home. And it felt like about five or 10 years ago, the first uh, cigarette that somebody smoked was not toba tobacco, but became yeah. marijuana. And it has exploded in popularity. It really has. 
How common is it among teens and adults? Yeah, uh, well, very common. And depending on your convictions on marijuana, uh, you, you might even say scary common. Um, so uh, here's, here's a few stats, just like 19 to 30 year olds, just that generation above teenagers. Uh, daily use, uh, over one in 10 men, 7.6% uh, women. Uh, monthly use, 30% of men and a quarter of all women. Uh, annual use, which, which is not a lot, but, but, but that's 43% of men, 40% of women. And then uh, for, for teenagers in high school, and these stats are from, from uh, uh, 2019, coming out in, the, in, in this huge book called Monitoring the Future National Survey Results on Drug Use. 6.6% .6 of eighth graders, 18.4% of 10th graders, almost a quarter of 12th graders use marijuana at any one time over a, a 30 day period. Wow. And with, with acceptance growing, with availability and ease of access growing, I think those numbers are just gonna go up and up and up. Um, and so if you're in a state where it's not legal right now, uh, uh, you will be pretty soon. <laughs> I think that's probably right. So, this might seem like an obvious question to some people, but you've done research into this. Explain what marijuana is and how it affects the brain and the body. Whew. Okay, so marijuana is a plant, uh, the, the, the cannabis plant. Um, typically, when we think of marijuana, we're, we're talking about the, the processed uh, cannabis plant. Okay. Um, it's, it's a very complex plant. Um, and if, if you've seen it at all, you know, like the, there's, it's on bumper stickers all over the place, this nice right. green leafy plant. Uh, once it's been processed, it, it looks more like something from a lemony snicket book cover, right? It's, it's kind of, but, but, but I think that just speaks to the, to, to, to the complexity of it. it it's, it's usually dried. Um, the, the, the part that affects the brain most is uh, uh, THC. And uh, THC is a, it's a uh, cannabinoid, I, I, I guess you'd say, or at least it, it plugs into the cannabinoid receptors. And we have these all through our body. And uh, the, the, the body will create uh, cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, I guess they're called. Um, and, and then it, these neurotransmitters will communicate one, with each other and it controls virtually everything about us bodily functions like appetite and digestion, metabolism, pain response, mood, sleep, your, your cardiovascular system, muscle formation, all sorts of different things. And, and especially in the brain, things like thinking and pleasure, concentration, coordination, memory, time perception, basically everything that makes you who you are. And uh, THC is an artificial, if you want to call it, uh, because it's it's not one that the body is making, but it's something yeah. that comes in from outside, and and it fits in or it plugs into these cannabinoid receptors and basically artificially stimulates them. Hmm. And depending on what part of the brain uh, the the THC is is in at that moment, and and it, of course it goes all through the brain, it, it will do a variety of different things. Uh, and so 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 really uh, THC is a is both a depressant and a stimulant because it, it has so many complex effects on the brain um yeah so so that's just a little bit about how it works that that stunned me when i read in your book that it said it's a depressant and a stimulant like how can it be both and it mm -hmm. seems to be the point that you're making is that Alcohol tends to have a more common effect on people, mm -hmm. but marijuana has a range of different effects. It could be somebody's age or their maturity, their mood or factors we don't even understand. Is that why it can mm -hmm. be both? Yes, absolutely. And I, I, I think I use the term already that it's a, the, the, the cannabis plant is a complex plant, plant with many different components. And, and, and THC, uh, which is just one of the components, it, it, it affects the brain differently because your brain does different things with different uh, functions, I, I, I guess you could say. Um, okay. And so uh, sometimes it, this, this cannabinoid receptor will, uh, when it activates, it, it will function to stimulate certain neuro activities. Sometimes it will work to calm them down just a bit. And so uh, you're going to get a range of 
of um, uh, of effects uh, from from THC, which is really the component that the people are going for with with, with marijuana. So how is the marijuana today different than the marijuana of the free love movement in the 70s? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, I said that it's um, that the, the, the people are, 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 are looking for THC and uh, breeders are growing or I, sh I should say growers are breeding or, or whichever way you look at sure. it um, for higher THC levels all, all the time. And so. Uh, if, if you were to walk into a, a marijuana dispensary, you, you would see uh, usually some sort of THC percentage number. Uh, the higher, obviously, the, the more potent it would be. Back in the 60s and 70s, in the, you know, the, the age of free love, as you said, or, or Cheech and Chong, um, usually about 1% to 2% THC, okay. typically on, on average. Today, you'll walk into a dispensary and you'll see THC contents from 17% to 25%. Wow. Uh, THC products like oils and edibles uh, can have THC concentrations over 90%. So, so wow. really potent stuff. That's really interesting. Okay, one of the objections that I've heard, and by the way, I see some questions coming in here for folks who uh, join us. We're here with Todd Miles. He's done some research and has a book coming out this summer on cannabis and the Christian with Brahman and Holman. And uh, we're walking through the effects of marijuana, dealing with a lot of popular questions. And we're going to take some questions I see coming up here in the comment section. But I've heard that marijuana is not addictive, but you claim mm -hmm. differently in your book. Is it addictive or not? Uh, yes, it is. Now, is it as addictive as some things? No, no. Mm -hmm. um, so here's just a few numbers. Okay. So like nicotine. Uh 32% of adults will develop an addiction to nicotine uh, with regular use. Heroin and cocaine, 23% and 17%. Alcohol, about 15%, right? About 15%. Uh, marijuana for adults, only about 9%. So, so one in 10 adults who okay. regularly use, and, and, and regular usage is usually three to four times a week. One in 10 adults will develop an addiction to it, a, a clinically diagnosable uh, addiction. Adolescents, it's a little, it's a little more addictive. 17% uh, of those who regularly use uh, wow. will, will develop an addiction to it. So, uh, now, so again, is it as addictive as a lot of things, even like caffeine? No, it's not. But, but not as addictive doesn't mean not addictive. Since you mentioned it, let me ask this question that often comes up that says, I'm guessing you live in the Portland area. You're probably fine with coffee, maybe like good coffee. Is that yeah. a fair comparison? Somebody says, I like coffee. I might even be addicted to coffee with marijuana. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, first off, just confession, I don't like coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a Portland fraud in, in that. Um uh, yeah, uh, there, there's probably almost as many coffee shops as cannabis dispensaries in Portland. Uh, it's it, there's probably more coffee than, than cannabis, but I don't know. It's it's close. Um, so he, here's what I would say: um, caffeine is, is psychoactive. That is, it has an effect on our brains. And so the question is: is it the kind of of effect that enhances capacities, okay. or does it um, diminish capacities. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we have to look at it holistically. Uh, I would argue uh, that, that caffeine can be used effectively, even as a stewardship before God. Uh, that it, 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 so caffeine is certainly a stimulant, mm -hmm. and I think that can be used uh, strategically. Is caffeine addictive? Yes. Do I want to be addicted to anything from a biblical standpoint? No, I really don't. Because if I'm addicted to something, then I've created an, an, an artificial physical dependence upon it, uh, which probably means that it's going to cause me some pain or worse. And, it, and this is how addiction is, is defined. I'm going to start making really harmful choices in order to feed that addiction. So uh, if uh, I would say caffeine addiction is wrong. Uh, if, if, if you start making bad choices uh, in order to feed that addiction or 
too much caffeine can be dangerous, right? Mm. Um, now, so, but but I did say earlier that that caffeine I think can be used strategically to enhance capacities. Okay. Um, you know, so like it, it it stimulates you, it kind of gets you going in the morning, whatever. Um, I'm not quite as concerned about that than the negative effects of of a substance like like marijuana. Okay, that's fair. Here's a great one that I'm gonna. Where's some questions coming up, and I'm just gonna roll in here because you talk about this in your book. Here's a great question from Joe. He says, "What are the implications to prenatal care?" Is there any studies on this, on the effects of marijuana on the unborn? Uh, yes, <laughs> there are. Um, uh, the uh, uh, health officials, and, and especially those who, who deal with, with pediatrics and, um, and um, OBGYNs, uh, that sort of thing, uh, there have been studies done, and, and they are very concerned about marijuana use uh, by, by pregnant women. Um, I can't remember exactly what the uh, concerns are. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'd have to go back and look at it. But I do reference in the book uh, studies that show how um, there are uh, deep concerns about this. And, and uh, OBGYNs will, will, will recommend do not, do not use marijuana. I mean, I, even if you're just smoking it, right? If you're just smoking it. Um, smoking your lungs is not good. Um, at smoking your babies, uh, or smoke, uh, or THC or pollutants transferring to your child. That's just not a good thing. Hmm. That makes sense. So, since you brought up smoke in the lungs, one of the questions I wanted to ask about is, uh, is smoking marijuana as dangerous to the lungs in particular as tobacco, because I've heard from many people, it's not as dangerous, yeah. and to say we should get rid of that comparison. But I think you argue differently. Mm -hmm. Well, I do. Um, so it, you know, to be perfectly fair, is it as dangerous? Probably not. No, um, but it does contain many of the tars that uh, tobacco smoke does, and it's still smoke and pollutants in your lungs. And the American Lung Association is very, very clear on this. No, 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 no. And, and I mean, that's, that, that should just be obvious to people, right? That heavens, if you're near a campfire and you're breathing in smoke, that's not good, right? And so, um, yeah, uh, is, is, is marijuana smoke good for your lungs? No. Is it benign or harmless? No. Is it as problematic as tobacco smoke? Probably, but again, just because something is not as uh, yeah. dangerous doesn't mean it's not dangerous. I appreciate the nuances that you bring in your book. You don't overstate the effects of marijuana, but you don't understate them e either. So maybe the, the effect of lungs is not as bad as many cigarettes, but it's still bad. It's not as addictive, but it's still addictive. I think that's a very mm -hmm. healthy balance that as I read your book, I'm like, he's really trying to report what the data shows. What about secondhand smoke? Would it be the same thing since it's just smoke with marijuana secondhand? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, not not as dangerous. Are you going to get high from secondhand marijuana smoke? Probably not. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you you would have to be really close to a person, but uh, uh, but it's it's still it's still smoke in your lungs. It's 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 not good. Um, and uh, you know. What we would want to be concerned about too is who are the ones who are breathing in secondhand smoke? Okay, uh, family members, young people—that's uh, it's not good. What about one of the things that interests me most? Because I have three teens and I speak to students a lot, is how it affects teen brain development. And I I tweeted this out earlier today because it was one of the things from your book that. It made sense, but I didn't realize how drastically some studies reveal that it affects the development of the brain and in particular mm -hmm. IQ. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the the data on this is conclusive. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's just not it, it, it's not debated. Now, the extent is debated, but but not the fact that that uh, the THC interferes with brain development just full stop, you know, 
you know, like nine out of nine dentists surveyed will tell you okay. that this is, okay. that this is what goes on. Um, and I, yeah, I, I joke about the dentist, right? But um, yeah, and, and, and the problem, of course, is that the, the brain, uh, well, the, the human brain develops for, for quite a while. Uh, women, usually uh, your the brain is fully developed by, you know, 18, 19, 20, sometime around there. Uh, for men, for males, uh, about eight, age 25. 25, uh, wow. 20, yeah, cannabis use in teenagers is just a really, really poor idea. Uh, one study showed an eight point drop in IQ if you use regularly as a teen, eight points. Now that number is disputed, but okay. what's not disputed is the drop itself. Um, and, 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 and that eight point drop number it, it came from a, a, a very reputable source. And, and when we're talking at eight points in IQ, when like most people are lumped in that 85 to 115 range of, of, of what your IQ is, eight points is a lot. Yeah. That, I, so I, really bad idea for teens. What, what got me most, as you said, when somebody goes off of it, there's no evidence that the brain reverts back to the earlier IQ, that this is permanent damage. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. That, that, that is where the evidence is pointing. Uh, you can make foolish decisions as a teen and pay the price for your entire life. That's a, that's a, that's a sobering, sobering statement in reality. I appreciate you speaking on this because there's a lot of voices saying, don't say it, it's fine. So I appreciate your bold yet evidence-based conclusions. One of the things that interests me is the link that you talk about between marijuana and psychosis and mental illness. What is that link and is it causal or is it just correlational? Oh, so, so that's a good question. Um, it, it, it seems that the evidence points to a causal effect. Now, exactly why, I, just like with, with any mental illness, uh, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly uh, what is causing what. But, but the evidence is growing all the time for a strong link between marijuana use and psychosis or, or other forms of mental illness. And uh, you're not going to hear that from uh, the culture at large. Uh, it's either ignored or it's glossed over. That link is just dismissed or, or, or it's just flat lied about. Um, uh, teen use is especially problematic here. Um, but what, what seems very clear from the data is if you have, an, if you have a history, a family history of mental mm -hmm. illness, that regular marijuana use will accelerate your, your plunge into mental illness. Um, and, and the more you smoke, the higher the risk. Um, what are the numbers showing us here? A, a 2002 study in New Zealand found that for people who had used marijuana by age 15, they were four times more likely to be diagnosed with some schizophreniform disorder uh, and depression by the age of 26. Wow. Um, so the, 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 that link is, is huge and, and more and more evidence comes in all the time. And you are not going to hear this from the marijuana lobby. You're, and, 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 it's lo and it's strong and powerful. You're not going to hear this from Hollywood. You're not going to hear this in mainstream media. Um, it's, it, it's remarkable. Those, those authors who are writing on this and trying to alert uh, the public to it are, are, are in many times being blackballed. It's, it, it's a, it's an odd phenomenon, um, by, by people who up to that point had been reputable, uh, investigative reporters and, and people were happy to publish their whistleblowing on, on other things, but, but marijuana, oh no, hands off that can't touch that. So wh why do you think Todd, if there was such a push from the medical community, from the media, to get the word out about smoking and cutting back on cigarettes. I lived through that time. And I remember we're not going to have Joe the Camel a cartoon because that manipulates kids. 
We're going to get rid of advertisements. We're going to put warnings on all the labels of cigarettes so people know. Mm -hmm. Why a movement in that direction when marijuana has at least comparable effects and maybe others the opposite direction to cover this up? What's your? I know it's a question about motivation, but what's your best guess? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, a, a powerful lobby, hmm. a, a very, very powerful lobby, um, a strange cultural dynamic where when it comes to drugs, we want to be as libertarian as possible, even as during this pandemic, for sure, we're inviting more and more government control into our lives. It, it, it's an odd, it's an odd sort of thing. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't get it. It, it, um, it, it wouldn't surprise me, I suppose, if, 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 if something horrible were to happen and then there would be some sort of reversal on, on, uh, public acceptance of, of, of marijuana but at, at this point it, it, it is a very powerful lobby and uh, the the information is out there I, I don't you know I, I I wrote this book I want it to be like pew level I want to be able to hand it to a high school student sure. but it has a lot of end notes in it not because I want you to necessarily go to the end notes but I want you to know that all of the facts or the statistics that I'm stating they're in medical journals. They're in reputable medical journals. Uh, I, I, I really tried not to overstate anything. I, 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 I don't want to say more than the Bible says, uh, but there's still plenty to work with when it comes to what does the actual science tell us. That's really helpful. When I read your book, it was very clear to me. I was like, okay, everybody who smokes marijuana doesn't necessarily have a mental illness, doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. get cancer, doesn't have all these effects, but many people do. And the evidence is clear that it's addictive for some, reduces IQ for some, that there are negative effects hands down with marijuana. And the data is clear about that. Let's yeah. shift and talk about the issue of uh, scripture, how we would approach mm -hmm. this Christianly. And then I, I'm guessing some people have some questions for you. Here's the way I've been asked this question. And it basically goes something like, if God made everything, and it was good, then why is it wrong to smoke pot? Well, I, I think God did make everything, including cannabis, including the cannabis plant, and it is good. That is, it does what God wants it to do. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that I can use it however I want. Lots of good things are misused. Lots of good things are used unwisely. Some things are used sinfully. I, I mean, heavens, God made strychnine and arsenic, right? That that doesn't mean I'm going to eat <laughs> <Okay>. it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you yeah, know, uh, uh, even something like like uh, sexual intimacy, a really really good thing, used wrongly, can be devastating to people. I so think I guess that's my short answer. Oh no, that that's that's really helpful because. The Bible says it's good. So you're saying the marijuana plant itself is good. And I know mm -hmm. it's been used for rope. It's been used for other kinds of materials in good way. Your concern is not the use of the marijuana plant. It's the misuse. It seems right. to be the heart of your concern. And that's true for God's design for sex. That's true for food. That's true for other things that are part of God's good creation. So I think that's smart to just, and, and biblical, to affirm yeah. that. Let's take it a step further. So then what is the concern with it being abused? What biblical principles should we start to bring in in terms of saying, okay, time out for a Christian who approaches this? Yeah, well, here, here's how I would approach it. Uh, I, I don't think we just automatically replace all the biblical references to wine with pot uh, because they're, they're different, they do different things. Um, but one really helpful thing about the scriptures when it comes to uh, alcohol use is that it, it, I think the Bible is very clear that alcohol is a gift from God, but it can be misused and drunkenness is absolutely a sin. God doesn't just forbid drunkenness, though. He tells us why. There are scriptures, scripture after scripture after scripture that explain why God forbids drunkenness. And if you, if you look at all the biblical data, which I, I tried to do, 
I, 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 I was able to categorize all of those prohibitions and, and reasons for the prohibitions in, in three broad categories. Uh, God forbids drunkenness because it diminishes physical control. It, it diminishes our cognitive abilities and it diminishes our judgment. Hmm. And all three and, and the THC, a, a THC high does all three of those things. And so we don't really even have to make the case that, oh, yeah, I, I should just replace, you know, all, all references to alcohol with, with pot and then just kind of read the prohibitions off. Okay. No, it, I, 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 I think we can make a more rigorous case for it, a more nuanced case and say, well, why? Why is drunkenness wrong? And, and what we find is that the same exact things happen when a person is high on THC. Uh, demonstrably, loss of physical control. I mean, who most people are not at their physical best when they're high, right? Sure. They're, they're, it, it is a depressant, right? It mellows you. You, you lose some fine motor skill. Uh, cognitive abilities, I don't think there's any doubt about that, is there? And, and then judgment, judgment. Um, the, 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 the evidence, again, the, the evidence is, is there. Um, and so when we're thinking about something like, like marijuana, which the Bible does not explicitly mention, I think we have to uh, dig deeper then. And we're saying, so, so what biblical wisdom is there that I can apply? Um, and and when, when I'm making the choice, am I going to use marijuana or not? Well, I, I, I might want to think, uh, can it harm me? Can it harm me? Can, can, is it addictive? Okay, well, I mean, that's just another kind of harm. Um, is, is my getting high on marijuana is that going to have the same effects that drunkenness has? And if so, then it's clearly wrong at that point. So uh, I think that's the kind of Bible work that we have to do. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm tracking. You're saying we can't just take out the Bible verses against alcoholism and insert uh, the use of marijuana. But when you look deeper at the basis for mm -hmm. why drunkenness is wrong, it affects the mind, physical control, etc., those same apply to the use of marijuana when somebody's high. Is that correct? Yeah, Did I sum that up? That is okay. exactly what I was saying. Just okay. Now a lot fewer I imagine words. somebody going, "Well, look, that's against drunkenness, but you can mm -hmm. still use alcohol without being drunk. Again, it's a blessing." So, what about yeah. somebody who says, "Look, I just use some. It's under control. I'm not addicted." Um, can't I use it recreationally in the same way that somebody uses alcohol recreationally? It would seem like your reasoning would apply to allow at least some use if I'm following oh. consistently. Uh, sure. Okay. So, so, so I'll just say yes. Uh, I, I suppose you could make that argument. But then I would want to ask, uh, what is it that you're actually doing? Okay. Now, you're either self-medicating at this point. So, you know, something to take the edge off, right? Uh, something that calms me down a little bit. I'm not going to smoke so much that I get high, but I'm going to, you know, basically self-medicate for, for whatever I feel is ailing me at the time. Okay, well, now we've moved into more of a meta, uh, perhaps a medical marijuana question. Um, or, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, most people when they smoke pot, unless they're just lying to themselves, they want to get high. That's that's mm -hmm. why they smoke pot. Uh, true story. I, 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 I walked into one of our ubiquitous uh, marijuana dispensaries here. They were super helpful, super kind, brought out charts, told me all sorts of stuff uh, about how marijuana works. And, and a lot of it worked itself right, right into the book. Um, I, I, I told them exactly what I was doing. They wanted to be as helpful as they could. And so then I asked them, I said, now this is going to sound really, really dumb, but is there any reason to smoke pot recreationally than to get high? And, 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 and the lady there literally laughed at me. <laughs> like, what a stupid question. Of course, there's no re other reason to smoke pot recreationally other than to get high. Um, so, and, and tr also we should say that um, marijuana, is especially if, if you're smoking it, it works itself into the bloodstream much faster than alcohol does. And so it's a whole lot harder to, to, to like smoke marijuana in moderation, right? Oh, uh, interesting. You, you, you get the effects of marijuana much quicker than you would if you were ingesting alcohol. And that so, would apply so, also for like um, 
edibles as well. Uh, the, the effect of, of edibles is it, it takes longer to uh, to obtain. Let, let's come back to the edibles. I think that's that's important. But what we're saying is somebody getting drunk or having the motivation for getting drunk with alcohol makes it necessarily wrong. But there could be other mm-hmm. justifications for using alcohol. The Bible justifies and considers a blessing. But yeah. when it comes to marijuana, there's not the same parallel because the whole purpose is to get high in using marijuana. Is that fair? I think that's what I'm saying. Now, I'm, okay. I'm open to the possibility that a person could say, no, I want to smoke marijuana in moderation for this reason, this reason, this reason. But I think at that point, you're treating it like medical marijuana. And I think that's another okay. issue with a bunch of other different questions to ask. Let, let's just briefly talk about that, because there were a few questions people had about medical marijuana. Before reading your book, mm-hmm. I think my answer would have been, hey, if a doctor thinks it's a good idea and it helps, I don't have a problem with it. Now, I think it was pushed medically as one step closer to getting it approved in all of society. So strategically, I've had some concern. But if it genuinely helps and doctors agree, like, okay, fine. Like, I don't have a principal problem with that. But you raised some questions about how much it really does help in the book Mm -hmm. that I was not aware of. So talk about your view of medical marijuana. Yeah, it's... uh complex, uh, hopefully very nuanced. Um, so what, what three words would I use? I, 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 cause I, I thought about this question. Uh, first word, sympathy. Uh, if, if people are suffering and, and, and they, they're turning to medical marijuana, it's probably because they haven't found anything that a doctor can prescribe that will help them. Uh, and you have my sympathy. Um, so, so that's one. Word. The second word, uh, overselling. <laughs> hmm. uh, there is very little evidence that medical marijuana actually delivers what it promises. I, I think it oversells wow. and it and it under delivers. Um, what do we know about THC for sure? Uh, it increases appetite, or in the vernacular, it gives you the munchies. That has been scientifically proven. But we always we always knew that, right? Um, it also uh, reduces nausea, so that can be very, very THC can be very very helpful for those who are like on chemotherapy or on other kinds of medications that uh, that, that that bring about enormous nausea. Um, and I totally understand why people might might turn to something like that. Uh, here's the good thing though, is that doctors. Or, or pharmaceuticals have isolated okay. those the, the THC component from the cannabis plant, and they have made separate medications that can be prescribed and dosages can be controlled by a doctor. Um, so, uh, but so, so those are two things we know for sure. After that, it's a pretty thin list. There's a long list of things that people are hopeful that it will help. There's a very small list of things that we know for sure. Uh, the most common is is pain. Uh, people use it to control their pain. There's really no hard evidence that it diminishes pain. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but when people try to actually do a scientific study, the results are all over the board, and 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 they can't be duplicated. Uh, maybe at least we could say this: that uh, that, that smoking marijuana. Uh, kind of mellows you out and you don't care as much about being in okay. pain. Okay. And, and, and if you're in really bad pain, I totally understand why that would be a plus at that point. If, if you, if, I, I, I totally get that. Um, so, so, so sympathy overselling. My third word is, is hopeful. Um, I, I, as I've, I've said, the, the cannabis plant's super complex. There's all sorts of components. Um, and I think we've just only begun to scratch the surface of, of what some of those can do. And so I'm hopeful. Um, there, there are some other drugs uh, that come from the cannabis plant that are used to control seizures, uh, including okay. in some childhood uh, uh, seizures that have been very, very, very difficult to control. And so, so, so these are just a godsend. Hmm. Um, now, is a doctor like saying, you know, here, uh, 
go to a marijuana dispensary, you know, smoke two joints, call me in the morning. No, uh, those, those components have been isolated. Those components have been isolated and, sure. and, and parents are able to control dosage of this particular drug that has been FDA approved. It's gone through all of the rigors uh, that we're more and more aware of in this COVID environment now, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so, 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 so hopeful. I, so I guess those are my three, my three words on medical marijuana, sympathy, overselling, hopeful. That, that's really fair. I was aware of anecdotal evidence, but not aware of the lack of rigorous mm -hmm. scientific evidence for it consistently helping with the conditions we often hear that it helps with. So yeah. very balanced. I appreciate hopefulness. I appreciate the sympathy. Those of you listening, we're here with uh, and watching. We're here with Todd Miles. Uh, he is a university professor, seminary professor like I am, and he's got a book coming out on Cannabis and the Christian in summer and he's given us some of the insights from his research by the way if you're new to this channel make sure you hit subscribe we've got some other interviews coming up including with a 12 year old brilliant apologist on friday and an archaeologist from amman jordan uh, next week so we have some fun interviews coming up well let, let's keep going i've got a bunch for you here okay. one thing i've heard is these marijuana churches popping up which is something yeah. I sometimes I feel like I've heard it all. I'm like, okay, this is a new one. Did not see this coming. Uh, tell me your thoughts on what about the claim that people say that marijuana enhances their relationship with God? I would want to know why. Okay. Uh, why do you think that is? Um, most of the anecdotal evidence from people that I would have that, that, that I would understand to be uh, committed followers of Jesus who believe the same gospel that, that Sean, you and I do. Um, most of the most of the anecdotes that I hear from them are I was just struggling with pain hmm. for so long uh, that, that and and you know people who are suffering, your world just shrinks and, and, and it is really hard. It, it is super hard. If you're dealing with chronic, chronic pain, that will affect every aspect of, of who you are, including your relationship with the Lord. Um, and, and so, so, so I, I think what, what has happened is, is, is that people are, are better able to manage some, some parts of their life. And so that enhances their relationship with the Lord. Is there anything going on with THC or, or being high? that uh that kind of opens you up to to uh broader spiritualities uh you know like a la 1960s uh I, 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 there's there's just nothing in the scriptures that suggests that we should be taking some sort of pharmaceutical in order to open ourselves up to uh greater spiritual planes uh now if if Sean, you and I were into Eastern mysticism, uh, that sort of thing, uh, then then maybe you could make a stronger case for that. But but when it comes to being a Christian, God wants us body, spirit, mind, right? Biblical meditation is not emptying your mind and, and thinking in the abstract of things. Biblical meditation is is rehearsing the Word of God in your mind and thinking hard and intentionally and deliberately. Um, so I'm super skeptical and, 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 and I'll just lay all my cards out here. The, the, those marijuana churches are, in, in my opinion, are, are largely just fronts for marijuana distribution. Wow. That's, that's not as big a deal now as, as maybe what it once was when marijuana was illegal. And, but, you know, they could get by uh, with some sort of, of freedom of religion exemption. To, to, to peddle the wares. That might not be true in every case. I might be super over skeptical, but uh, that's my concern. I think that's fair. You cite quite a few where the cross and the gospel gets pushed aside to certain yeah. experiences with God that are more Eastern mm -hmm. mysticism than the kind the scriptures talk about with fellowship and studying the scriptures and prayer. So I think that's very fair concern that, mm -hmm. uh, that you're raising. Uh, one, one of the points you talk about that I think is really helpful is where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible me, for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. 
how does that apply to whether a Christian should use marijuana and how do we test if something is good or beneficial? Yeah. Well, so to, to not be mastered by something is basically uh, some, something other than the Lord Jesus Christ is acting like Lord over you and, and directing your affairs. Um, not everything is beneficial. Uh, so, you know, the Christian life is not the easiest life. Uh, Jesus was not a bait and switch guy. He, he, he didn't promise us our best life now. He, he said, take up your cross and follow me. He said, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Um, and, and so there might be some things that are beneficial, but, but are very, I'm sorry, there might be some things that are permissible, but are just unwise. I don't have time as a follower of Jesus for this. I, I can't be sidetracked by this. Um, and, and that's not to say that, that, that I don't love recreation. I, I, I love recreation. Right. I, I love enjoying things, I, uh, amusements. I love all those things. Um, but but can I justify those before the Lord? Can I say thank you uh, to, to the Lord for this thing? Because it is it, it, it has enhanced my life and has, has brought me joy and uh, greater fellowship. Um, uh, does this promote the things of the kingdom of God? Love, and joy and peace. Um, Again, is, is this the kind of thing that I can tell the Lord thank you for? Uh, is this the kind of thing that uh, that is going to prove to be a stumbling block to others? Well, if so, then the Bible's very clear on that, right? Mm -hmm. Paul was willing to give up some freedoms for the sake of not destroying his brother in the Lord. And that, that language of, of destroying, as you, as you know, is, it, it's a very powerful yeah. word. Um, yeah. it's, it's not like, you know, inconvenience my brother. It's, it's literally like destroy my brother. Um, and so, so I, I, I think there are a series of questions that, that, that we can ask, e even if you think the, that the Bible gives freedom to engage in marijuana. So like, maybe you don't buy all of my arguments. And, and again, I, I tried not to say the Bible says it's sin, but sure, I, sure. I just, I, I just tried to bring biblical wisdom to it. Maybe you're not compelled by, by, by my case. What you ought to be compelled by then is, okay, so, so maybe I'm just going to treat this as though it's a gray area or an audiophora. Well, what are the kind of questions that I can ask? Because the Bible does speak explicitly to these kinds of things. You just, you quoted a few verses uh, to, to that effect. Um, so I, I, I think there are some good questions that, that we can ask. Does it promote the kingdom? Can I thank the Lord for it? Is this something that I can do without shame? Is this, is this something that's going to be a stumbling block uh, to, my, to my brother or, or sister in the Lord? And, and if so, then the biblical wisdom is very clear on this. Then abstain. Abstain. You don't have to exercise this, this liberty. Todd, I, when I read your first book, you know, I, the, the, you wrote on superheroes and uh, like docetism and these other heresies related to Christ. I absolutely mm -hmm. loved it, thought it was creative. I didn't know what to expect in this book. And I thought you were bringing a pastoral voice. You're trying to avoid mm -hmm. legalism, but speaking biblical truth mm -hmm. unequivocally. And I think anybody, if they think you're too conservative or they think you're too liberal, I think a serious thinker when this comes out needs to really wrestle with your ideas this summer. Now, here's a question that some people have asked, and I apologize, I missed this. Uh, people have asked about CBD oil and your thoughts or concerns on that. Yeah, uh, my, my thoughts on that are super expensive. <laughs> That's what CBD <laughs> is. Um, but it's not psychoactive. And so I, I if, if you want to spend the money on CBD, uh, in my estimation, it's more of a stewardship issue because <laughs> um, okay. it's really expensive. Um, but it there's some evidence that, that, that it does have some uh, good benefits. A again, uh, boy, CBD is everywhere, right? Uh, you cannot walk into any kind of store. It feels like, I mean, if, geez, it seems like they're selling it in 7-Elevens. Um, uh, Amazing. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but it's it's not psychoactive, and so, so so any of the concerns that I raise about THC, uh, pretty much none of them obtain when it comes to CBD. Um, if 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 I wanted to spend the money on CBD oil and, and, and was convinced that it worked for whatever it was that I was hoping to 
to, to get out of it. Uh, you, you could probably do that with a clear conscience. It's that that's that's fair. Super helpful. If you have questions for uh, Dr. Todd Mile, T Todd Mile, sorry, I can not pronounce it. Put it in the comment section, and uh, we'll try to get to him as quick as you can. Just the last few minutes uh, that we have. I know there's a lot of questions people have um, remaining for you. I'm curious, what surprised you about this research? I thought that I was going to write a book that was even more nuanced than what it was. Okay. Once I actually got into the, 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 the medical studies, I was shocked and, and, and honestly a little frustrated that this, this message had not gotten out. Wow. Um, that, that, uh, that, that, that marijuana is actually more dangerous than uh, what I had thought it was. So uh, my my book, I, it, I think that people who read it, um, most people already have some convictions on marijuana. And, sure. and I'm probably not going to hit exactly where any one person's convictions are. And, and if that's the case, then typically what happens when I talk on it is that, is that a lot of people think I'm too liberal and some people think I'm way too restrictive. Hmm. Um, and yeah, uh, I was surprised at, at the amount of, of data that is actually out there if you're willing to read the medical journals. And, and they're all cited in the book. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's more dangerous than I thought it was. I, I was completely surprised by the links between um, uh, psychosis and mental illness. Uh, I had, hadn't counted on those. I have a, a friend who's very much uh, an advocate for mental illness, and, and he's very well aware of it. Okay. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, he, if, if you have a history of mental illness in your family, do not smoke pot. Wow. Do not smoke pot. Here, here's a good question that I, I'd love to get your thoughts on. It says, uh, how does he, uh, Dr. Miles, feel about microdosing through edible mints, five milligrams, to unwind like some people have a glass of wine? Yeah. Um, so again, at that point, you're looking for a certain medical benefit out of it. And, and, and then, so drunkenness would, would not apply. Um, and then it's just a question of working through uh, those questions that I raise in the medical marijuana uh, chapters of the book. Um, if you can use marijuana without getting high, then it's not obvious to me that the prohibitions on drunkenness apply. Um, but what I would encourage a person to do who is submitted to the Lordship of Christ is go to the elders of your church and, and just lay your cards out on the table and say, hey, th this is what I'm doing. Uh, I, I don't want to sin. And so I want to do this openly. Um, would you hold me accountable? Would you ask me hard questions about my ability to actually microdose? And uh, in the same way that as, a, as an elder in, in a local church, I would be concerned about someone who has to go home every night and drink a glass of wine to mm -hmm. unwind. Um, it, you, <laughs> uh, you're probably too dependent on that substance. Uh, and maybe there's some other discipleship issues that you need to think through. Todd, that's great. I saw a comment that said, I'd love to see a debate with Todd and someone on the other side. Maybe, maybe we won't have a debate, but maybe we'll just have a little bit of a conversation. We can have you back to talk through some of these issues with maybe a Christian who sees it a little bit differently. I think that'd be beneficial for people. Now, some have asked to flash, they said, Sean flash his book across the screen. Now, it's not out yet. And really kind of what we did, kind of a 30,000 foot view through some of the big issues you cover in a lot more depth. But tell us just quickly about the book and when it'll be out and where they can find it. So the uh, you could find it on any platform that sells books. Uh, you could 
I suppose you can pre-order it right now. You, you can see the fancy cover on Amazon. Uh, so it's there. You can see uh, it's supposed to come out August 17th. I suspect it will be out a okay. little earlier than that. Um, so probably around July, you could start looking for it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, it, since, since the scriptures don't directly speak about marijuana, I, I, I think in order to apply the biblical wisdom, we, we have to know how marijuana works. I, I, I think we would want to know the risks involved with it yeah. to, to make a good choice. Yep. Um, and then we'd probably want to know something about the law. Uh, because because laws vary from state to state. Uh, sometimes marijuana is just decriminalized, but still illegal. Um, it's, it's you know like, it's treated like a misdemeanor, a speeding ticket, that, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes medical marijuana is legal, but not recreational. Other places, mm -hmm. recreational marijuana is legal. Um, and so, but but you're definitely want, going to want to know what the laws are uh, because I think those are are insightful. Sure. Uh, Civic law is not a reliable guide to Christian morality, certainly. Um, there's lots of things the law forbids that are good. There's lots of things that the civil laws also uh, pro, uh, allow that the Bible says are clearly sin. Um, that's okay. That just means that we have to uh, submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ and, 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 and be wise. Um, and then at that point, I, I think we need to know a little bit about how uh, the Bible speaks about uh, drunkenness. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of walking you through the book at, sure. at this point. Yeah. Yep. Um, then, uh, then I think we need to then start connecting dots in terms of discipleship. And uh, again, as I've said multiple times, I, I don't ever come right out and say marijuana use is sin. Uh, I want to treat it from a discipleship perspective. And so I have a series of questions that, that I think you should engage uh, be, before you decide to use marijuana. Um, and, and then I look at, uh, at, at medical marijuana. I have a couple chapters on that. And it, th those read a little bit differently. I, I, I talk about who we are as humans and, and I talk about suffering as well. I think we have to have a good theology of, of what it is to be human, a good theology of suffering. Uh, then again, ask discipleship questions. Um, those, the, the answers to those discipleship questions I think sometimes are very different when it comes to uh, the medical use of something. Um, you know, heavens, uh, no one goes into surgery without anesthesia, uh, with, sure, without sure. an anesthesiologist there, right? Well, that's about as mind altering as you can get. And yet, and yet in the church, we don't say, oh, huh. this is forbidden. You shouldn't use anesthesia, right? Um, uh, I, I, I could find absolutely nothing sinful about, about using a psychoactive drug for acute pain, um, right? Like, like when you're recovering from surgery or something. Uh, so so the, the, the answers, the, the discipleship answers, I, I think, will be different when we're talking about a medical use. Um, but the questions have to be asked still. The discipleship questions have to be asked. Right. Well, I think that's great. So your book, the title is Cannabis and the Christian. That's the final title. Isn't that right? It is. So yeah. it, it, if folks are enjoying this and benefit from it, just go over to Amazon or any bookseller right now. You can pre-order it. And I would definitely give the thumbs up. It's very readable. It's interesting. There are a lot of eye-opening statistics to me. And you made me think about a lot of stuff. I haven't fully landed in my own mind on a handful of these particulars, but you cover it, I think, as graciously and thoughtfully and you're asking the right questions of uh, any book that I've read on the topic. So it's great works. Very, very quickly, tell our listeners where they can find and connect with you. Yeah, well, you uh, email tmiles at westernseminary.edu. Um, I have uh, I, I'm Twitter, TL underscore miles. Um, Facebook, things like that. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, I have a podcast called Food Trucks in Babylon. Uh, that I do with a co-host and um, Sean, we need to get you on there. Let's do it. <laughs> That'd be fun. Um, and yeah, those are the main ways I think that just, just through the normal social media stuff. Well, that's awesome. I super, super appreciate you coming on again. I hope people check, check out your book, uh, cannabis and the Christian really, really well done. Um, so thank you. Thanks for doing that coming on. Thanks for great answers. Those of you listening 
Uh, if you're enjoying this, give us a thumbs up. And remember, this channel is in partnership with Biola Apologetics. So you've ever thought about getting a master's degree. Todd, you might want to know this. Just this spring, we are first going a full distance program in Talbot, our degree in apologetics, oh, which is exciting. Funny. I think we're going to get a lot more students. So if you have an undergrad degree, um, there's a good chance you could get in the program and we'd love to train you. And we also have a certificate program if you're not ready for a master's yet, but just want some formal training, um, look down below in the description. We've got a good discount for you. Make sure you hit subscribe to this channel. We actually have some really fascinating interviews coming up. I met a 12-year-old uh, boy. He emailed me through his parents. He read my doctoral dissertation and had some questions for me. We Zoomed last week and I was blown away by the thoughtfulness of this kid. So Friday at lunchtime, I'm going to interview this 12 year old about his generation, his love for apologetics. Super fun. Next week, we had an interview with uh, an archaeologist. Joel Kramer is coming back, lives in Amman, Jordan. We have interviews with Nancy Piercy and Wayne Grudem coming up. So mm -hmm. some really, really cool content that you won't want to miss. Hey, thanks for joining us. Todd, hang on. Don't disappear. But uh, hopefully those of you, we could see you Friday at noon, we'll be hanging out with the next apologist, 12-year-old named Nahoa. That's going to be a lot of fun. Hope uh, all my viewers can join us then. So thanks, and, uh, and God bless. Have a great night.